point in which we talk about collaboration, probably the hottest topic in relationship to innovation, um, and also probably the most misunderstood topic. Uh, so I hope we will have a, a very interesting discussion today uh, around uh, around collaboration. I will start with a scientific definition of what collaboration is, and I, I will then make a, a, a short point concerning the relationship between innovation and collaboration. Then I'll try to... Um, uh, describe collaboration in um, in a social interdependence manner and try to give that perspective that uh, that will that will help us understand what does it take to build conditions for successful collaboration and then we will we will end up with uh, with a uh, with a discussion uh, i will change a little bit the the way in which um, I will present the scientific evidence now, and I will not talk about meta-analytic results as I as I've done before. I would rather talk about some uh, research that uh, that uh, we have done using uh, uh, a particular simulation, uh, behavioral simulation that is um, supposed to help people develop collaborative skills and awareness. So let me start with a short definition of of collaboration, and 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 here I I, I copied two two perspectives in, in 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 principle collaboration means it's a relation it's a relation between two or or, or more parties in which these parties exchange something that is of value for themselves and for the others in order to to create um, a, a systemic or higher order benefit um, that can serve, that can help the parties to achieve their own uh, their own interests. So we talk about about collaboration as a relational process in which in which uh, different parties, it can be people, it can be groups, it can be organizations, uh, uh, have different assets or have different knowledge or or, or can um, can construct or formulate a particular complex problem in, in, in a specific way that is of value for others. And, and in, in, in doing so, in integrating all these different views on the problem, in, in pulling all these different resources available in different parties, in sharing their different interests, you come with innovative solutions, with, with, with creative uh, 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 um, uh, solutions to, to to very complicated, very complex problems. Now, you you could ask, well, is this process relevant for you know, innovation? And the answer is uh, straightforward, yes. And here uh, I, I presented a graph that that um, was published in a, in a paper in Science in 2007, in which uh, it, it is shown that um, in time, starting with the 1960s. The incidence of teams, the use of teams in the innovating innovation uh, process increased systematically. So you see here towards 2000 a substantial increase in the number of teams that will that will uh, deliver patents, but also the, the the size of the teams. So so pretty much what what this graph says is that innovation doesn't happen anymore in a um, in a uh, secluded uh, space in which a single individual working somewhere in a, in a, in a garage will, will change the world. No, innovation happens through collaboration, through pooling resources, sharing knowledge, developing knowledge uh, in, in teams across organizations. And here you have some, some additional titles also extracted from science in which uh, important innovations, important complex problems like the uh, Antimatter, or or uh, or the human chromosome, or 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 uh, uh, cures for cancer are actually tackled by teams uh, through collaboration. So the major the, we could we could safely say that the most important innovations nowadays actually are generated through collaboration and not individual efforts. And the question is, do we really truly understand the collaboration process in such a way that we can we can make use of it in the best possible way? So. So let me let me give you a perspective that um, that was dominant in social sciences starting starting with the, with the, with the 1950s, and and this uh, this perspective on collaboration is rooted in the so-called interdependence or the extent to which the individual goals of the individual of the parties of the of the uh, departments organizations, so the extent to which these individual goals are aligned. And it's pretty, you could say it's pretty simple in terms of framework. And it was introduced by um, Morton Deutsch 
and and his 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 approach was well we we can we can describe three forms of goal interdependence if you if you look at at social systems um in the in the in the one perspective, you say the, the, the goals of the parties are positively aligned. That means that um, if a party achieves its goal, also the other parties in the system achieve their own goals. So that's positive interdependence. Um, on the other hand, you could say uh, the, the, the goals are negatively aligned in the sense that if a party achieves its goal, then that party will prevent the other parties in the system to achieve their own goal. So in, in a sense, it's a fixed pie uh, 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 context in which the more someone takes, the, the less is, is left for the others. And then a third situation, which is less relevant for, for collaboration, as we discussed today, is the independence. That's the context in which actually we are independent of each other. We can achieve our, our, our goals without any interaction. Now, um, in order to understand truly positive interdependence, which is the essence of collaboration, in my view. Um, I, I would like to rely on an example. It, I, I, to me, it's the best example I've seen in my career. And it, it's an example that is used by Sandra Schreier when she talks about collaboration. Uh, and, and, and you will see some work that we did together. And she says, well, you have to, in order to understand what collaboration is, you have to imagine um, that, that, that analogy with the with a lame and blind person. So imagine a person that cannot walk and a person that cannot see, and they 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 both want to make a trip. Now, now separately, um, neither the blind nor the lame can 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 make it from A to B. But if they if they if they pull their resources together, if they join what they can do together as a system, they can make it from A to B. You know, the 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 blind person will be the, the the eyes of the blind person, and the blind person will be the the you know the legs of the of the limb person. So, the 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 core issue of positive goal interdependence is this focus on on diversity, on what we can do, and not the focus on what we cannot do. And this is this is um, a perspective that that clarifies a little bit what does it take to build collaborative uh, uh, relationships. Of course, the negative interdependence will be the opposite of, 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 of collaboration in which a party takes most of the of the resources or or uh, uh, acquires more m m most of the of, of, of the things available and, and the rest uh, are, are deprived from achieving their aims. So I hope that 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 clarifies a little bit what 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 this means and and in 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 terms of uh, discussing collaboration as social interdependence we have to understand that everything starts in the minds of the people that participate in that relationship so everything starts with expectations and this is this is something something very important. If we discuss about collaboration across departments, if we talk about collaboration within a group or um, within the organization as a whole, it all starts with the expectations that the actors have when they engage in the, in this relationship. And you know, social psychology says, um, uh, actually, interdependence theory uh, uh, argues that every time we we envisage that we will engage in a relationship we make expectations for it and we say yeah how would how would this play out w would it be conflictual would it be uh, will we have a a, a, a a collaborative relationship and these are the two lines that actually shape the road to uh, to innovation when when stakeholders interact if they start from expectations that yes you know i need the others in order to succeed i and i can i can add value to the others in order for them to succeed that's positive interdependence and that generates collaboration and 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 fosters innovation that's that, that's the blue line however if i think well actually i don't uh, I, I don't need the others to uh, to 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 achieve my my aims actually i need their resources so i have to take their resources and i have to prevent them from taking from from using their resources that conflictual expectations uh, uh, that set of conflictual expectations generates conflict 
and 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 what what uh, what uh, the social interdependence calls contrient interactions and that eventually uh, reduces innovation so it's quite important one of the first messages that that scientific messages that i would like to put forward today is that collaboration starts in the minds of the ones involved so it it, it all starts with the expectations of what will happen and and of course um, uh, from those expectations, then you engage in behaviors. And let me now uh, share with you a few insights on on collaborative relations. And and here I would like to to talk about some some simulation studies that we use. Uh, and here I work with Sandra Schreier for uh, for uh, for twenty years uh, using these uh, uh, behavioral simulations to teach people. Um, what collaboration means, teach people about the complexity of collaborations. And these behavioral simulations are not uh, uh, oversimplified situations. No, this a simulation lasts for two days in which um, uh, the real simulation is, is a little bit over one day and the rest is the briefing and trying to make sense of what people experienced uh, uh, in, in, in that relationship. It, it has seven parties that, that each have their interest, their information, and they engage with each other trying to uh, create and find the collaborative potential uh, for for the whole system, and here we report this, the the results of eleven rounds of of, of this multi-party simulation. The simulation is called the Yacht Club. With uh, rounds that we we, uh, we we've done in a, in a very large organization, and and this project lasted for two years. Um, and in in this in this rounds, we we started with asked we asked the participants, you know. To what extent do you distrust the others? Not we did we did not focus about trust. Why? Because trust in in collaborative relationships has to be built. And when you start from the expectations, oftentimes you 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 question the interests of the others, and you 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 start from a from a more reserved position that 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 sometimes is distrustful. You know, so so we we categorized. Uh, the, the, uh, the the parties that started with a high level of distrust and these are the uh, these are the red bars here and the parties that started with a rather low distrust in the others now if you if you look at the onset so we asked the expectations before they even interacted with each other they had all high aims and they said well you know we will all be effective in our collaboration when they started to interact, they realized, oh, collaboration is not that easy. And then the collaboration effectiveness kind of dropped in the in the in the second time. And if you look at what they achieved, the blue bar representing the groups that started with low distrust, they achieved much more in terms of collaboration effectiveness than than the groups that started with low uh, with with, di with 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 very lar large distrust. So, so. This is this is an, an important study, I believe, uh, illustrating the fact that we should not um, we should not um, imagine that parties that engage in collaboration they start already from from a existing trust. No, sometimes the expectations they enter the relationship with are are are, are expectations of distrust, and and they have to work their way through the distrust and 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 build relationships and and try to engage with each other to build that trust and change shift the distrust and and cope with this negative effect that 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 the distrust have so here you clearly see that that the most benefit uh, uh, we get if the organizations if the if the the parties that engage in, in in collaboration start from a low distrust towards the other they they capitalize more on the collaborative uh, 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 relationships. That's that's quite an important uh, 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 insight that I would like to share, and that's the second insight. So yes, collaboration start in the mind of people, and one of the important elements that we have to focus on is is distrust. You know how 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 much distrust is there at the onset of collaboration because that has to be managed. Now another element, and this is another paper we published recently. Uh, refers to participation, and this is a different uh, uh, dif different paper that only uses two simulations, which actually differed because it happened. Uh, we didn't plan it, and and you have to uh, you have to know that we don't intervene with uh, with the, with the parties while they work, so they have the freedom to act in whatever want, uh, way they want. And in one of these simulations, 
the leading party decided to exclude three parties from from um, the the first meeting, and two of the parties were always excluded from from the from the discussions. Um, so so you have a natural situation in which in what in one simulations you had you, you had full participation and in one simulation you had really fragmented participation so you, you you didn't have the representation of all the parties that were needed so if you if you look at the onset when they when they uh, when they communicated their expectations in terms of goal achievement the two simulations didn't differ so the red simulation is the one in which people were excluded parties were excluded as soon as they started to interact of course the, the complexity of collaboration kicks in and their goal achievement kind of drops from what they expected they will achieve. But it, it's a very significant drop or more significant drop in the party that in the, in the simulation that excluded parties. And that significant decrease uh, uh, remains at the end of the day, at the end of the simulation in which you have the, the, the uh, simulations with the full participation that achieves kind of the level of uh, 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 of of goals they 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 were hoping for, but certainly not the the simulation in red with a low participation. So this is this is an uh, this is a, 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 a weird happening, but is is some sort of a natural experiment that can show you how important participation is. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, there is no such uh, no, no, there is no similar empirical report in in collaboration in which you have really a manipulation of participation in a controlled setting so quasi control setting so that's another that's another element the third lesson that i would like to put forward today namely that you need stakeholder participation you cannot do without and now i, I would like to quickly conclude with with a summary of the literature uh, we we analyzed 10 years worth of collaboration literature and then and then we we found support for this model in which uh, we we start from from diversity stakeholder diversity i mean collaboration requires diversity you cannot talk about collaboration without without talking about diversity you cannot talk about you know the lame and blind uh, 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 analogy without taking into account their differences their differences are needed you know and that that diversity doesn't you know doesn't work if it's suppressed and very often what you have in these complex collaborations is fantasies you, ha you have fantasies like we we are all here with the same interests we we talk here with the same voice we have the same goals in mind that you know that's a suppression of of the interest and the diversity that exists in the system and that eventually even if it leads to 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 some sort of preliminary harmony in the end it generates conflict that 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 decreases innovation and 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 we called this path that starts with the false consensus uh, a, a, a relational dissolution path what you want in terms of collaboration is to to generate cognitive synergy and and that requires conflict and that's another element that i would like to put forward here you cannot really talk about collaboration without task conflict you have to engage with each other you have to disagree with each other to find a way i mean imagine the blind and the, and the lame you know they had to disagree and and synchronize their actions that that's not easy to make the trip but but that disagreement has value and it's it, it's one of the core prerequisites for, for for collaboration. So we cannot talk about collaboration without diversity. We, we we cannot talk about collaboration when diversity is suppressed. We cannot talk about the collaboration without task conflict. So this is really a, a, a few a few other messages that I would like to uh, to to emphasize here. Now the trouble with task conflict, and I mentioned that in the last talk as well, is that it often triggers degenerates into relationship conflict. And the cure for that, I mean, that that's a path that that's that's a that's a, an evolution that we don't want. We don't want the the healthy task disagreements to evolve into into uh, 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 dysfunctional relational frictions. And and the way in which you can block the 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 the, the, the transition of task conflict into relationship conflict is through trust, build trust, and that's that's the way in which you can manage. Uh, you can manage uh, effectively such such collaborative relations. So a few take home messages. Um, so first one, diversity, participation and conflict are something 
are, are, are prerequisite. You need those. These are required. These are prerequisites for, for collaboration. Collaboration starts in the head, in the minds of the ones that will engage in the relationship. So it's quite important to understand what sort of expectations they get into relationship with. What, will they expect positive interdependence? Will they expect negative interdependence? Why? Because these, these expectations actually trigger behaviors. Then don't be seduced by the, by the harmony that is associated with the false consensus, because at the end of the day, that will be costly. That will generate relationship conflict, because that, that, su that suppresses diversity, and diversity is then... Uh, manifested in a dysfunctional way through relationship conflict instead of be, of being channeled constructively into collaboration through task conflict and 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 then finally trust trust is is a valuable asset but but you know we we don't always have to start from the from the idea that trust is a given no trust is not a given in a relationship very often relationships start with distrust and you have to work your way through distrust, you have to manage distrust in order to build trust and 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 engage successfully uh, in 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 a, in, in, a, in a collaborative synergetic relationship. So shortly, that's the sort of empirical evidence I wanted to share with you today. So as a take-home message, you know, uh, uh, collaboration requires diversity and participation. Uh, yet, 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 you have to expect conflict that is dysfunctional relationship conflict. And you have to mitigate that properly in order to be successful. So, shortly, that's my that's my story for today. Um, Theo, floor is yours. Uh, yeah, no, I yeah. try to reflect every time when Pedro tells a story from the scientific point of view. It seems that easy, uh, but now he put a black and a white point, uh, one black, you need diversity in collaboration, and on the other hand, you will have conflict. And I think that in practice, make it very hard and difficult uh, to, uh, to manage high performing teams or to create high performing teams. Uh, I start with what's in my mind, uh, because Pedro said it started with what's in your mind. In my mind is, that everyone wants to be a valued member of a winning team uh, with an uh, inspiring mission. Uh, because the mission is the direction you, you work in. And if your own values are synchronized with the values of that mission, I think you can engage and you have some common sense and some common, common ground. Valued for me means in the diversity uh, uh, aspect that you can bring in your thoughts, you can bring in your uh, knowledge, you can uh, bring in your, your attitudes and habits, and they are recognized as helpful for the end result. That doesn't mean that every time your uh, opinion is uh, taken over, uh, but, but you can bring it in and you will feel safe uh, to do so. Uh, and the winning team, I always think it is more fun to win uh, I'm a supporter of uh, Feyenoord and it's always hard uh, to be there if you lose against Ajax uh, again, uh, so winning is, uh, is more fun. And I also think in collaboration to, to foster trust, you need quick wins. Uh, no, I have to say different because a quick win is not sustainable. A quick development or a quick growth. So you should kickstart uh, the collaboration uh, with, with, with each other. That said, uh, it is you have different levels of teams when you work in an organization. Uh, first of all, I have my own team. I'm a managing director, I have a team, and that's the easiest part to build that team. Because if you take in diverse uh, persons, you have fair processes for decision making, you have a, a right direction and you, you foster the, the collaboration. The trust in that team can, can grow and will grow because they are all connected and are not influenced by by others uh, and mostly uh, th this can do within three to six uh, months to to make a high performing team when i can do that in isolation 
But unfortunately, <laughs> you never work in isolation. Uh, I, uh, I, I always have to ask myself, in what team am I? Is it the team that I lead or is that the leadership team I'm within? And for APG, that's the leadership team I'm within and not the team I'm leading. And that leadership uh, team I'm in can have different uh, conflicts or can have different prioritizations or have a different meaning than when I only have my, my own team. And you can see those differences uh, when you hear uh, a, a lot of discussion about the prioritizations. What shall we do? And there are teams are very dissatisfied that their priority is not taken over and discussing that for three, four, five, six months and blame the chief because he didn't get the right priorities for his team. I see that discussion every day at, at APG and it is polarizing between teams. Sometimes they say those people from ICT or those stupid marketeers. If you use that words, you have a competition within your own organization instead of a competition with your co concurrency organizations where you have to win from. And if that is, then I think you have a problem within your organization. It is hard to solve that, but if you align from uh, your mission, bring that down uh, to, to into several steps uh, and don't make a yearly uh, plan. I never made a, a yearly plan only for my team. I only brought that in in the higher plan and didn't make a solely plan because otherwise all those people in, in my team said I want to do this, I want to do that and you have to, to create that, you have to facilitate that. Another thing is working like uh, coffee. Uh, I don't know whether you know the story about uh, the sand, the stones, and what, what's important and what is urgent. Uh, if you uh, bring in first the points that are important, then you have a lot of space and a lot of time to, to do the things that are urgent. And what's urgent is mostly in my own, te in my, uh, my own team. And what is uh, important is what came out from my leadership's uh, team. So that, that, that's a, a way yeah, you, you can, uh, can, can solve uh, the prioritization problems uh, uh, within an organization. The, it becomes even more complex if you have to work with other organizations. Yeah, for example, APG is working with other organizations at the Brightland Smart Service Campus for innovation. And the first question we always have, can we trust the other organizations that start to work? Because steal they, will they steal our ideas? Whose intellectual property it will be? Instead of looking to the chances for working together to uh, include other organizations, other points of view, we first start because there was some distrust by uh, uh, looking what can they steal from us and how can they use our knowledge and will that be in disadvantage for, for us? And surely you should be, be do that. But I, I always say start cooperation from, from trust. When I was born, I trusted my mother. I drank milk from her boobies uh, without thinking whether it will be good to drink or not to drink. And I learned to distrust during my youth, because my person, my, my older said, oh, those people from Holland, right, they come uh, to get here the best uh, jobs in, in the, the coal mines uh, or, or so on. So when you are born, you are with, with full of trust and you learn to distrust. And I hope and what we can learn is uh, keep, keep, keep starting from trust until you are uh, uh, feel that uh, the other part is not worth trusting and then you have to leave. And I say that because that's one of my uh, beliefs. You, you have two ways of, of thinking, the Rhinelandish model and uh, the Anglo-Saxon model. And I work with uh, organizations uh, who are in the Anglo-Saxon model. And if we make a contract, the contract is 500 pages. Every possible thing that will happen is described and how we handle. And when I work with Rhinelandic uh, uh, organizations, we have only a letter of intent how, how to work. And that's a total different starting point for the cooperation. When I married my wife, we had a letter of intent. 
Now uh, we are divorced. I need a lot of. No, I'm not divorced. Was a joke. <laughs> yeah, but that feeling is at the starting point. If you have a letter of intent and you can uh, bring in the letter of intent every time uh, the other person or the other team is not working, conform that intention. You can confirm that and discuss why isn't doing. If you have a contract, you will follow uh, the contract and will not collaborate. So that was my uh, reflection on what uh, Petro uh, said. Yes, uh, you need diversity uh, and uh, collaboration to improve. Yes, you need the conflict to uh, have better uh, results. But after you had the, uh, uh, the conflict, you should be friends again and, and not remain in a, a relationship that the conflict matters. And six months later, you discuss again the same topic because you, you, you did it. And the better you have your vision and your mission uh, and the values uh, uh, that, that, that you bring in into that, that, that mission, how better that is synchronized with the teams or the, in the individuals, and the better the collaboration will, uh, will be. Petro, the floor is yours again. <laughs> oh, th thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Theo. But I think I think you you made you made great uh, great points here, and uh, I see there are there are things in the chat. Maybe we could uh, uh, we could start with uh, with them. Uh, certainly, um, the contractual part, the mission, the vision will help set the expectations that you get into uh, in, into collaboration with. Um, and uh, and uh, this this could this could facilitate uh, such a such a such a quick start in uh, in the collaboration relationship. But let's see let's see what the uh, what the audience uh, said and uh, and then move move from there. Um, Johan, okay, would you, would you like to 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 state your question or? Uh, Yes, uh, I think uh, well, I started to work as a, as a Scrum Master or Agile Coach and I noticed that it's very difficult, uh, this kind of stuff, huh? uh, this kind of Lencionia uh, um, team to yeah, manage teams, the wrong word, to get them on a higher level. And uh, lately I, I read a book uh, that we should go from teams to teaming. Uh, I, have, I think we still have less time to form teams and we have different teams and already we have kind of ecosystems yeah, outside organizations. And I think that um, and the theory is maybe easy, but in practical, uh, in the practice it is, you know, most people don't have enough time yeah, to get the trust, to, to build a team. And I think the book um, High Impact Teaming maybe help a bit uh, so that you will can faster um, work on teaming uh, especially if you have uh, teams they are not joining all the day in one room in one organization uh, so that's, that's, a very is, uh, good, yeah. that's a very good point yeah that's a very good point and also uh, you know Teo was touching on that when when he mentioned three to six months to build really a uh, a team sometimes you don't you don't have that and uh, and of course it's easy to say that in theory you need good relationship, you you, you need you need uh, uh, harmony, you need uh, constructive conflict. All these things um, are easy to understand, but but they are they are they are much more difficult to achieve. And uh, to some extent, you can you can lead the team through those development stages um, if you have a clear vision. If you if you are an inspirational person who can you know glue the team together, I think you can make faster steps towards towards really making a functional team but 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 oftentimes a team is not is not an isolated act actor and you could as as they mentioned you know you are embedded as a leader in your management circle but also your team and now your team operates in a context in which the other teams uh, might not be just collaborative. They also can compete for resources, you know. So at a certain point, you you will need to make a budget, and the budget is a pretty much a fixed pie. So it's it's not you cannot you cannot uh, 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 you know position it in a different way. So in in a, in a sense, 
um, teams in an organization they they compete and they collaborate at the same time and at the same time individuals in a team they collaborate and compete at the same time they compete for promotion they compete for status and 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 so on so this is uh, it's it, it's easy to say that you strive for synergy and you want to avoid conflict but the reality of it is that both of them are coexisting all the time so so the, the you know the question is how to how to capitalize on this and and certainly leadership can make a difference and make the but the team function very uh, uh, very swiftly. Um, contractual agreements can can speed up the the process and and resolve a little bit the distrust. And also uh, the mission, a clear mission and vision, can set expectations for collaboration that will maybe prevent the team to engage in disruptive conflicts. Maxim has a question. Yes, actually, uh, Theo triggered me with one of his uh, statements where he said that uh, you experienced before that people say, OK, those guys from IT or those guys from from marketing. Um, and before I, I worked on a small pressure cooker assignment where we needed to well investigate for a corporation uh, how to bring uh, the salespeople closer to R&D and vice versa, because there were well technical sales managers and also application managers in between. So that was quite a long journey. And I had a, a question or maybe Maybe you have some experience on that, but until what ex until what extent is leadership um, should they utilize, let's say, KPIs to bring or incentives to bring people together? Because it's not from nature, or let's say, a salesperson wants to obviously they want to make sales because they uh, that's their job, and for R and D people they also have their own responsibilities. But until what extent could leadership play a role in bringing people together through um, KPIs or other uh, incentives? And that would then be a question for Theo. Okay, <laughs> I think it uh, it can play a role. Uh, for example, at APG, we we did that. Uh, we we said uh, what, when is our organization successful? When we can give an indexation uh, to retired uh, persons and so on. And otherwise, we all will not get uh, a bonus or, or something like uh, like like that. The other hard thing I think is. Uh, to be role specific is also very important in teaming. If everyone goes across the organization, uh, that will be a problem. So you have to add KPIs also to what you expect from that team individually or the person individually. And for me, that will not always be the, uh, the hard results, but you can also show I want to see. Uh, uh, I, I will tell something about. Uh, I, I will look to you the way you uh, collaborate. I will look to your empathic competences. I will look how you help your colleagues to achieve something. I will look whether you make a step aside to give another the priority because you see that it is better. So I, I don't think it should be KPIs in which the result only it is result driven, but also on the way you are working in the organization. And if you say, uh, if you get, get a step aside and you reward that instead of saying, hey, he is not getting his own uh, KPIs because he is doing something for, for someone else, no one will give will get a step aside. So, so you should reward the right behavior and the right habits. Uh, and that's more important from that, that, that than uh, all have general KPIs. I think it's a this is a very interesting point, uh, Theo. And I I would um, I would like to answer also from a managerial perspective. I'm I'm leading a a uh, research program, so I, I'm taking my 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 scientist hat now off. Um, we 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 struggle at the you know at the university on on whether we we should integrate research across different faculties and departments and make a unified multidisciplinary research that will kind of position the university much better because it kind of bundles resources, you know, so especially for your, for a small university that can be tempting. But then the question is that every group wants to do their own thing, you know, so they so they they, they all want to they all want to keep up with the with the with the disciplinary with the disciplinary research and 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 keep doing what they were doing and you know putting KPIs in terms of integration will not will not really really work but what it did work and it worked in a in a in a cross departmental fashion was an incentive structure so 
in, in 2017, for example, we created a, a fund for research in which we, we funded a re research project that actually brought people from different departments together, at least two or three departments, you know. So, so in that respect, you create an incentive structure in which people have to come together to, you know, to reap the benefits and, and use the resources. And that incentive structure really created collaborative relationships across department across departments and and to some extent we we use the same logic now with an incentive structure at the university level hoping to create collaborative relationships across across departments so simply kpi is simply a, a leadership intervention in which you say Yo, you know uh, this is valuable for all of us multidisciplinary research is valuable for all, all of us which is which is true and this is this is a good vision for a small university to kind of play a role in in, in multidisciplinary research, but that alone will not work. You need an incentive structure that will that will foster collaboration and and and, and support collaboration across across uh, groups and across uh, across boundaries. Why? Because as humans, we always have a tendency of sticking in the smallest social entity we can find. So if we are put in a group, then the tendency is to close the boundaries and say, you know, we are here. This is what we do, and and the university is you know the not the university the the organization is somewhere above, uh, far away, and and then the other interest and the subordinate interest we don't we don't we don't really see as uh, as well as our own interest as a team. Then can I add some something to it? I think also the structure of the team and the roles are very important to clear that out. Eh? Johan was, was talking about teaming. I think more and more teaming will be important to, uh, to bring in teams, multidisciplinary over the organizations, but supported by the organizations. And with those kinds of, of teaming, you can make a, a, a small speedboat in a, in a huge organization and to go some faster as that we did everything in the traditional uh, structure. So ways of working, agile ways of uh, working, multidisciplinary teams are very important uh, instruments uh, to, 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 to bring in more collaboration between uh, persons. And uh, if the sponsors no, uh, are uh, sponsoring those teams the way they have to to do. Then, for everyone, is clear that that goal is uh, helping the whole organization instead of only one or two parts. Yeah. Some other remarks, questions. Yeah, there's another one coming from Johan. You want to? Yeah, sorry, just um, just just another kind of uh, tip, or uh, um, especially the, the context makers uh, have some kind of uh, different vision on certain things. I think, and they're talking about uh, the tree brain system and of Judith, Judith Harris. I didn't read it by myself, but uh, they talk a lot about it. And um, the idea is that people are very good to behave different in different environments and uh yeah by managing the context you could have more effect on uh yeah building the right teams or building on teaming that's just on the maybe interesting to read uh true 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 johan but but you know it's it's context is important without question but but um, theo had a very interesting uh, 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 remark in the in our first dialogue, and he said bringing the right people on board is essential. Um, so it, it's it's also important. It, it, it's you know from a social psychological perspective, you always see the performance as an interaction between personality in context. So cost, context is important. You know the the, the supportive organizational. Um, uh, um, Context is 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 uh, important, but it's also you know the interaction between the person and that context that generates performance innovation, and so it's I would say it's equally important to have the right people on board, uh, because sometimes sometimes is 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 far more difficult to change people um, than we think. I mean, if we look at the um, 
if we look at the uh, the research on um, um, for example, genetic influences on various uh, uh, work work behaviors, uh, you realize that that change is not that easy to uh, to, to to generate as as we might might hope. So then then in some instances it's better to focus on selection um, and and really create a con conducive context that will that will that will make that potential that you just hired um, um, realizable. Hmm. Yeah, maybe uh, for my end, uh, follow up question uh, to forward to Theo. Um, we talk a lot about a change or huge transitions and uh, leadership. Um, from my experience, I, I've been in a few huge transitions and uh, what I've experienced is, is sometimes the Top management explains uh, or expresses a vision, um, and on a lower level, the people tend to adopt uh, that vision and want to work with it. Um, where a lot of conflict enters is uh, with middle management, um, and like you already mentioned, yeah, sometimes it's better to select and uh, or reselect uh, them, but you cannot just um, wipe out the, the complete middle management and, uh, and recruit new ones there. So what is, uh, what is, what is, your, what, what is the role of, uh, of middle management in, uh, in collaboration, uh, especially in terms of, uh, in times of transitions? In times of transition, I think it will be the hardest position uh, because uh, you have to uh, connect uh, the top and uh, the lower parts in the organization, and that could be different interests. But on the other hand, uh, if you uh, don't think a vision is only made by three or four men in the board, but a vision is uh, uh, something that is 70, 80 percent uh, direction, and we fill it in with uh, middle management and the members of their teams, then it can be a, a more uh, uh, committed uh, vision or more committed strategy for, for, for everyone. Uh, I think what a middle man manager always should do is to be honest. I see a lot of middle managers who lick to the top and stamp to the, the person beneath them. And those are the ones who are saying in the team, oh, it is not my decision. It is the decision of the director who thinks uh, that's going on. Those you have to quit <laughs> directly because they are not, not helpful. If they say we go that direction, that's, uh, there's no doubt of, but we can look how we fill in that direction. Then he is participating on a positive way uh, to, the, to, 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 to the vision and uh, bringing in the the meanings and the, the knowledge and the competences of their people and bring that in and if they succeed in that so i really adapt that uh, that 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 vision i understand that and i start working on how we can uh, influence that or how we can realize that then it is a better then it is a better job i also think that we and, and you know, I, I'm really hard for persons. I always say that is, I say, say if someone doesn't fit in your organization, it's better for both to let them go because he or she will not be happy and the organization will not be happy. But we often make the assumption that the organization isn't that great because of our people. And that's a wrong starting point. And the starting point here also should be with trust. I trust my persons because they made the organization to what it is and you should be uh, in your feedback yeah, you should, you, you should uh, mention whether one is okay or, or not okay and you should have that discussion and if you don't start with the starting point oh i only i all, always need other people then i think that that will be wrong that that, that should be more fact-based and should be more in the discussion between the leadership team and the middle management and the persons uh, beneath those, those those middle managers. But but it is it, it is hard. I I think changing and transition is always uh, hard. And I don't think that we always have to make a revolution. You should change in a more evolutionary way. 
And if you change in a more evolutionary way, it will not be always that hard as it is now is. And now some new managing director comes in. I have a new vision. I have a new, <laughs> and then everything starts starts again. I, I have seen uh, the same system, uh, organizational structure six times again. And uh, uh, all we now will be more, uh, uh, we, we, we will go more for our clients. So, the uh, marketing team is more important and we structure them separate from the administrative team. It's all bullshit. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. so, so, so sometimes in a change, you should keep some things remain the same as they were because people then trust more. And because if I find a new job, for me, that's great. If I have to move for that new job to Amsterdam, then my family will say, hey, <laughs> is that okay? You're away from me. And if I uh, uh, leave my wife because I love that the, the job, then that job will not succeed eh? because there are too many diff, uh, different things changing in my environment. And one thing I learned from changes and transformations is that you uh, remain some things the same. The person you sit next on, on the office or the building where you are in or, 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 or something else, because otherwise no one has the trust to make the change. That's an, uh, that's a very wise set of 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 ideas, Theo, and they they fit with what we know from from research that that changes often fail, um, and and incremental changes succeed much more than radical ones. But also the participation. I love the 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 insight that you brought forward because um, very often these participative large scale interventions uh, seem to be successful. So you you know you have to change. Uh, you know that you have to take that direction, but then you can involve people in the organization to find the way to get there, and then the resistance to change will be lower. Thank you very much. Um, I think that was the final reflection, Petru, uh, on the reflection of Theo on all the all the questions and all the information shared. Um, I want to thank you a lot for uh, sharing all these insights and, uh, and sharing your reflections and. Uh, at least it helped me a lot, and uh, I believe the, the same goes for the audience. Um, we will come back with uh, with uh, with our follow up. Um, know that all these sessions are posted on our website and can be uh, watched back by yourself or your colleagues. Um, if you want to know where that is, please give us a message uh, to Ida, myself, or anyone else with the organization, and we will direct you to the website. Uh, I will share everything. Uh, thanks for joining for now, and uh, a special thanks to Theo and Petru, our guests. Thank you very much. See you soon. Have a great day. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.